12 games, one each month. Let's get started. First person shooters. They've become a staple of the last two decades that is here to stay in gaming, especially with the rise of VR in the last decade. But here on Appreciation Culture, we respect our elders. So we're going to start at the beginning with the old grandpa yelling about how he used to live on a farm with a pitchfork and a beagle. In this case, the pitchfork is an MP40 and that beagle is BJ Blaskovich. Wolfenstein 3D is the start of the history of FPS series. As always, I'm going to give you some facts, some development history, and a review. This is the first person shooter history series though, so we're not going to go as deep into the genre before Wolfenstein 3D. We aren't here to discuss Maze War, which was the original first person video game made by NASA students in 1973. Wait. 1973? Were there were there even fucking computers back then? Hold, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Give, give me one second. Give me one second. That was before the original Star Wars came out. But I know you've all played Maze War. We've all played Maze War. Hell, we've all 100%ed Maze War. Some of you may even be wondering why we're discussing Wolfenstein 3D. Isn't it just too old? To prove why we need to respect our elders, let me show you some footage of an FPS before Wolfenstein. This is called Battle Zone. Now here's Wolfenstein 3D. We aren't going to discuss every first person shooter game before Wolfenstein, but this does emphasize how important and how amazing the influence was of Wolfenstein on the video game industry. We'll talk about a couple of inspirations though. Two games in particular before Wolfenstein 3D came out that inspired it greatly. Starting with the not so obvious, you'd be surprised that Wolfenstein 3D was inspired off of a game called Castle Wolfenstein and beyond the Castle Wolfenstein on the Apple II in 1981 and 1984. So just to clarify, ID Software did create Wolfenstein 3D. We know that. But a lot of people believe that Wolfenstein 3D was the first Wolfenstein game. They were on a roll in the early 90s though, creating a lot more Commander Keen games that were doing extremely well and fun fact about BJ Blazkowicz but the main character of Wolfenstein is actually the grandfather of Commander Keen from the Commander Keen series. ID Software was so busy and the reason why they were so busy was because the two people in charge, John Carmack and John Romero, were leading the charge and they were obsessed with their work. These two fucking geniuses, like holy shit. They were trying to figure out how to make a shoot 'em up nasties FPS after acquiring the rights to the Castle Wolfenstein IP in 1990 for a cheaper cost than my Honda Civic. They literally bought it for $5,000. Like, are you fucking kidding me? $5,000 to buy the Wolfenstein IP? Thanks, George Bush. Thanks, Obama. Thanks, Trump. Thanks, Biden. Thanks, Uncle Sam. Thanks a lot, Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Why can't I buy the Wolfenstein IP for $5,000 nowadays? Hmm? ID Software at the time, though, had these two head masterminds at the throne, and that was, again, John Romero and John Carmack, who are considered the founders of the first-person shooter genre as a whole. John Romero's favorite game at the time when they purchased that IP was Castle Wolfenstein. He played it so much in the 80s. So naturally, when they were successful with ID and they didn't know what else to do outside of Commander Keen, they used that money to buy the Wolfenstein IP. But instead of making it another top-down game like Wolfenstein was in the 80s, he was inspired off of Indiana Jones and other action heroes to just make a first person shooter where you would just simply destroy nasties for the entire game. Now, what inspired them to make the game look the way it does though? Because as I showed earlier, this was another type of first person shooter at the time. And then this is Wolfenstein 3D. What, what inspired this point A to point B jump, this revolutionary jump? Well, that's when we go into our second game inspiration and that's gonna be Catacombs 3D. I'm gonna mention four different people and you're gonna hear these four people again uh, later on, but they're the co co-founders of ID Software, John Romero, John Carmack, who are the main two, but there was also Tom Hall and Adrian Carmack, who is, by the way, not related to John. These four developers, with Tom Hall being a designer, John Carmack was the main programmer, Romero was a programmer and a designer, and Adrian Carmack, who once again, not related to John Carmack, was the artist for these games. A moment of silence for how often Adrian Carmack has been asked if they are related to John Carmack. Smash that F button in the comments to pay respect. <laughs> 
So we have two Johns and two Carmacks, but that's okay because we'll hear them so much that won't even matter. John Romero grew up in a really harsh household though. His father was abusive and he grew up with the mindset that acknowledging your emotions would only lead to more bad things happening, which led him to unfortunately never want to talk about his feelings or talk about any bad things going on in his life. There's a story about a time where Romero's dad literally dropped him off in the middle of the desert with his brother just because Romero's mom said, hey, I need some time to myself. I need the kids out of my hair for a bit. And so instead of his dad taking him to like a movie, he dropped him off in the middle of the desert. The only place he felt a sense of escapism though was in the arcade and when making video games. Romero made video games in high school and had an extremely high ego due to his own insecurities created by the demons of his past, but also due to the amazing talent he had in video game programming. I would like to point out though that Romero after the 2000s did grow a lot as a person. He now donates to multiple causes through releasing games to the public at times, even through like a Doom 2 level he made in 2022 and then donated the proceeds to the Ukraine cause. Could still have an ego, but like that's besides the point. I, I do think people can change and I think it's important to acknowledge that Romero as a person has changed a lot. He's just grown a lot as an individual and we always want to give shout outs to that positivity here. John Carmack is the lead program on the legendary engine that was used for Catacombs 3D, which had the game director of Tom Hall, who also worked on the design of the original Doom, the um, the original Wolfenstein, and even on Duke Nukem 3D, where he helped out 3D Realms, which Duke Nukem may pop up again in this series at some point. Not not Duke Nukem Forever. <laughs> not not Duke Nukem Forever. There was one before that, and I swear it was actually amazing. It was not it, it was not bad. I swear there was a good Duke Nukem game at one point or another, even though it's been like 20 plus years. Carmack's game engines that he's developed throughout his life, though, have been used in games like Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake, Duke Nukem, Call of Duty, Medal of Honor, and Half-Life. His multiple engines have been a staple for so much of the FPS genre, but not without the help of the other people as well, like Adrian Carmack, Tom Hall, or John Romero. Why did I say Catacombs 3D was one of the biggest inspirations? though? People say that Wolfenstein is the first game to show a weapon in hand, but it wasn't. The first was Super Spy. That was an on the rails experience with fully animated weapons in hand. And Catacombs 3D was the second with a fully animated hand weapon that fired spells, but it was not an on the rails shooter. Wolfenstein 3D was off the rails as well, but you could now see fully animated weapons firing and it was all the different weapons you had firing. The early iterations of Wolfenstein 3D all had this, but they were actually a lot closer to what the original Wolfenstein games were in the 80s. It was going to be first person, but it was going to have stealth mechanics, like you were going to be able to disguise yourself as a Nazi, hiding dead bodies like in a Hitman game or something. They obviously opted against this, because in first person it was going to be too complicated, and it was also going to slow down the momentum of the game. I really don't know how much influence Wolfenstein would have had, though, if it wasn't as fast-paced as it is. Because when you think about all the shooters of the 90s, the one thing they all have in common is that they're all trying to be fast paced. Everyone at ID Software would be butting heads on the game's development though, and this would only get worse as they created more games. Tom Hall and Adrian Carmack though, were mostly not involved in these arguments. In fact, they would get so annoyed by how much the two Johns, John Carmack and John Romero would argue at times when making Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, and Quake. These two ego-filled maniacs of the 90s were just probably more alike than they would ever give each other credit for. Both were so obsessed with their work that they wouldn't even notice how much the other one was doing, so they would just crap on them for everything. Wolfenstein 3D began out of the want to have a simple villain to destroy. A $5,000 IP that Romero loved, the decision to go hardcore fast paced rather than slow stealth FPS, using John Carmack's engine that was used on Catacombs 3D to create a fully animated system of guns in an off the rail shooter. Adrian Carmack's art that still gets Easter eggs to this day with mech suit Hitler being the most insanely creative and fun boss fight, one of the most fun of the 90s. Tom Hall had the job of mapping the entirety of Wolfenstein 3D in less than half of a year which was not that surprising for 1992. But John Romero would design most of these maps. This actually leads right into my review too, because the most negative thing about this game by a mile is the level design. 
John Romero claimed in an interview that the level design of Wolfenstein 3D was the most boring part about making the game. He claimed that at the time of the engine, there wasn't as many assets or elements to be able to mess around with when making the levels, so they just all looked the same. And oh boy, they do. It's hard for me to gripe too much on Wolfenstein 3D because as we've been going through, it's kind of insane how much influence this game has had on the industry. It's, it's hard to describe in words. Like, you guys know I love movies, but if Doom did for first-person shooters what Halloween did for Slash, movies, then Wolfenstein 3D is psycho. And shit, lo, Catacombs 3D is like peeping Tom. Ain't nobody ever seen that movie. Wolfenstein 3D is psycho. It's the OG. You could run where you wanted, shoot whomever on the map, and the UI system is one of the greatest in gaming. And the game had around 50 levels, not even including Spear of Destiny, the expansion with over 20 extra levels in it. It's hard to put into words, as I said, how much Wolfenstein did for FPS games. It's not because it does stuff vastly differently from Catacombs 3D, but it's because it was also released to a massive audience with an internet-based release. Old variations of the internet, but unlike Catacombs 3D and other FPS games before it that were released on soft disk, Wolfenstein 3D racked in hundreds of thousands of dollars a month due to being released to such a wide audience as a freeware demo, and then you could just purchase it online and have it mailed to you. It was so successful, and even before it came out, companies knew it was going to be a hit. There were companies trying to buy Wolfenstein 3D for millions of dollars before it released. The legacy of the game, it went on to spawn Return to Castle Wolfenstein, which was the first sequel years later that was made by Grey Matter Interactive, which actually merged into Treyarch Studios, which currently makes the Call of Duty games after Call of Duty Big Red One came out. Insert at the top of the video because I do bring up that company in my Treyarch retrospective. Anyway, kind of had my little side ramp, but now we're back to the review of this video. The level design works for the first couple of episodes, but you do quickly start to see the deterioration, especially in the mid game. It's like you can just see Romero stop caring and just be copying and pasting hallways, the same stuff and making you run down millions of hallways or even be doing a secret to progress in the level, which is infuriating. Like that is that is so to be able to do a it's like you have to click on a secret wall and be able to unlock some area and then be able to finish the level like that's not how level design should work and there's only like two levels in the game that do that but that's still ridiculous and then all the other ones after the first couple of episodes just feel like repetitive hallways you feel like you're getting highway hypnosis while playing the game this would have been frustrating though even back when the game released and I'm sure that even if the game was met with critical praise the major flaw would be that some of the levels were boring and tedious surprisingly though one of the biggest critiques of the game at the time was that people were common think about how much violence is in it. I, I like, why would I care? You're shooting nasties. Why do I care if they're bleeding? That, And I don't think the ID software founders cared at all either. They even made a joke in their intro. It's called PC-13. And as the joke stood for, it stood for profound carnage, not political correctness. Please, for the love of God, don't make that joke. The level design does feel really lazy though, especially mid game towards the last bit of Wolfenstein 3D. But that's truthfully my biggest complaint. Point. The only other thing in the game that's really annoying is that the game is so difficult. For years, I played Doom, and for years I wanted to play Wolfenstein 3D, but because I would play Doom on Ultra Violence or Nightmare, I assumed I could play Wolfenstein on harder difficulties. This is not the same. Wolfenstein on harder difficulties is literally on hard mode, it's just Doom's nightmare mode, basically. There's enemies that will one shot, like I, I had to put it down to basically almost easy mode. There are enemies that will one shot kill you if you are near them on easy mode. Two shots! Bro, that is some horse freaking donkey doo doo dog shit, bro. What the fuck? I am not joking. There are enemies where you literally have to memorize where they are and pre-fire their corner because you'll die to them, have to restart the mission, remember where they are, and then fire at their corner. Or obviously make sure you're always saving in a game like this. You you have to make sure you're saving in these old games. Doing some speed running techniques really quickly. Or some dying techniques pretty quickly. Guten Tag. This is so messed up. It doesn't help too that every enemy has an audio cue, but them shooting you will begin before the audio cue 
ends, you'll hear a sound and then gunshot and then death. So you have no time to react to the actual sound cue that's happening. It's very frustrating and I recommend playing the game on lower difficulties. And like I said earlier, just saving a lot. So that means you don't, it means you can just avoid rage quitting. You don't need to like save scuff it, but save like every five to 10 minutes or something. The pre-fire and the difficulty though feels more like an outdated thing. Whereas the level design feels more like a lazy thing. Audio cues are a thing in every video game nowadays where you hear a character screech before an attack so you know to dodge them it's like how in elden ring there's visual cues and audio cues i could imagine them wanting audio cues just in case you don't realize someone is behind you but in wolfenstein when you hear an audio cue you're already dead it sucks and i wish they just shot like a second after the audio cue or something, but alas, this is an insanely old game. It's the grandpa FPS that's yelling at me every single day of my life, and I'm not gonna sit here trashing on it just cause of my two complaints. Some of those complaints, specifically the audio cues, feel like more of a setback due to it being an old game. It's just, you know, it has some memory problems. Grandpa's gotta be taken out every once in a while. Everything else in this game though works for me. And I'm honest when I say that, everything else works for me. I mean, just look at the adorable little face that BJ blasts makes when he picks up a railgun. You can't hate that. The music that's mostly made by Bobby Prince, these tracks are entertaining as hell to hear while you're mowing down nasties in any area. Like I swear when I enter the room to fight Mecha Hitler and I hear this track turn on, my face just goes. There's a surprising amount of enemy variety. They all use similar weapons. They all use the same ammo, but there's also these floating ghost guys who use projectile based attacks. And they're by far some of the most entertaining to fight in the game, even if they're pretty rare. And I will believe that they are the inspiration to make doom enemies have more projectile based weapons. Here's the thing about that statement, projectile based weapons versus a hit scan gun. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment about that really quickly. Weapons that are hit scan in a first person shooter are rarely engaging to fight against. Think about Call of Duty or Battlefield. You stand up, you get shot, you hide again, blah, 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 rinse and repeat. You could go take a shit while you're behind cover for all I care. You just have to get back up and fire at them and then repeat, rinse and repeat. That does not mean those games are not good, by the way, but I'm just pointing out that's my opinion on hit scan. And in games like Doom, Halo, Half-Life, outside of the human enemies that you fight in these games, you know why the enemies mostly use projectile based weapons. You know why the covenant weapons in Halo being projectile makes them absolute doggy doo doo in the multiplayer? It's because you can dodge a projectile, which may suck in multiplayer, but for the campaign, dodging the projectile allows the game to gain an extra layer of intensity because you're thinking about what you're dodging, you're thinking about it while you're being shot at, and you're thinking about shooting back at the enemy while dodging these bullets as well. It adds a whole other layer of thinking and intensity this is not a con with Wolfenstein, but I'm just pointing out why ID Software probably moved further in the projectile based direction and why that tends to have more of a fun value in FPS games. Back to enemy variety though, they've got zombie nasties, scientist nasties, ghost Hitlers, German shepherds, and I mean hell, you can even find Pac-Man ghosts. Seeing different enemies, even if you're going down repetitive hallways, does make things more engaging because you'll have different layers of mental health while playing the game when you see an enemy in front of you. It'll either be, oh, I can take this guy, or it'll be, no! Yeah! You're about to get one shot killed by somebody that you have that reaction to. You'll look at your health bar, which is located down here, by the way. So nowadays, youngsters, you know, people 25 years old like myself may see this and go, Tyler, you said the UI was amazing, but that looks fucking disgusting. Well, hold on there. Hold on there, bro. Here's a gold coin for that opinion. Everyone gets a gold coin for their opinions, unless those opinions are racist, sexist, anti-Semitic, or a representation of hateful behaviors. The reason the UI works, because if you take a look to my left, you'll see your ammo, health, and the weapon you have, all your important info. If you take a look to my right, you'll see the floor you're on and the score you have, which not nearly as important, but it's nice that they're listed. Now, if I would move the fuck out of the way. Grandpa Wolfenstein can show you the middle of the UI with grandpa's beautiful face and show you why I love this UI. For years, games have tried to perfect their UI systems by giving us different indicators of how much health you have, how little ammo you have, and Wolfenstein 3D was one of the first to give you the beautiful face in the middle of the screen that gets bloodied up and battered when you're low on health. So now when this guy is about to one shot you in the fucking face and you're saying, no, 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 no. You get a split second to look down at your health bar and start praying to God you get a hit on this dude. And if you look straight down at your health bar, if you see this, 
you're gonna be like, oh, okay, I'm uh, fine. If you see this, yeah, you're gonna die. Speaking of dying, if you eliminate a boss in this game, you'll get the original, the OG play of the game. Play of the game. You can just tell there's certain places where id Software loved spending time with Wolfenstein and others they just didn't care about as much. They loved creating the sound isolation where if you make a sound in one area, an enemy on another area cannot hear you. This was freaking revolutionary at the time in 1992 for a first person game to be doing this. And it's in nearly every game since then. They loved creating the enemies with Adrian Carmack creating the claymation models for their designs and the guns and the violence with the blood pools below your enemies. And yeah, I mean like the level design, sure it gets rough, but that's only in the last three episodes of the game, but it doesn't make the experience not worth it. I, I mean, I'll be honest, all the games in the series is gonna be worth playing. I mean, like it's history of FPS. You would hope that all the games on this list are gonna be worth playing. I wouldn't say though that you have to beat Wolfenstein 3D. I would strongly recommend playing the game up until episode three where you fight Mecha Hitler at the end of it. And that's around the halfway point of the game. And if you wanna continue, you can go for it. But if not, that's also understandable. And the legacy of this game is kind of hit or miss, but I can see somebody really getting into it. It just doesn't speak to me as much. I've never played ID Software's 2009 Wolfenstein game, and I've never been the biggest fan of New Order or Colossus. I do prefer New Order, but I never beat New Colossus, I got pretty bored of it fairly quickly. I did not care. I've never played Old Blood or Young Blood either. These games, I sound negative, but that's only because these games just don't speak to me as much as they do for other people. I never cared about the serious tone or the backstory stuff that they added into the more recent games, and it's just hard for me to get into it. The game did have a massive impact though, and it's still worth playing. And you'll see that not only with every game in the series, but you'll also see it with our underappreciated series that we're gonna do that will basically cover all the honorable mentions that are not in these actual videos. As the first FPS game with animated gun graphics that was released online to the public, it was always going to be a major influence. Every company that made an offer could see that to them. And Romero, who would make demands for even more money from these companies offering millions, he could see that the game was going to be a success too. The sound effects, the death sounds, the 2.5D characters that became more popularized with Doom and rendering that made it significantly less glitchy than Catacombs 3D, which even John Carmack has admitted to and a crisp RTX 4030 frame rate of 1992 of probably some shit like 15 frames. Buttery smooth, ooh, I would have loved to play that 15 frames per second. Apogee in 1992 released this game on an online bulletin service with the first episode for free, and if you wanted the rest of it, you have to be mailed at a charge. This significantly increased the sales of Wolfenstein and made it spawn like wildfire. And it even spawned in Wolfenstein clones, Doom, an entire franchise legacy. And being the start as to why the entire first person shooter genre is popular in the first place. It was 50% Wolfenstein and 50% being released on internet that led to its increased popularity. Without this game, another game would have taken its spot, but this is the one that popularized first person shooters and sent their love into the stratosphere. Wolfenstein clones started popping up around every corner and id Software would come to take everything they loved about Wolfenstein from the violence, the guns, the enemies, and improving the maps as they moved forward to create the iconic Doom game. All four of these founders are legends to the industry for their influence on games, and every time I hear that id Software is making a new game, my face just goes. I will give a heads up that these names will come up again as we go further into their history and development throughout this series. The contributions of Wolfenstein 3D to the first person shooter genre are nonetheless astonishing. So let's appreciate this art all the way till the end screen. And that's right, this is the end screen. People name their babies after you. You marry a movie star. You are so cool. I wish every game ended with a screen that said you are so cool. But alas, only the most influential first person shooter to exist can claim such an end screen. You are so cool, Wolfenstein. 
That's honestly the best review I can give you. Can't wait to go through this series with all of you, but this has been Tyler speaking on appreciation culture. I've got the sources where I got my info from in the description. Jump on the appreciation train where the whole point of these videos is to subvert rage and hype culture, which are both pretty disgusting things. We can have actual evaluations on games and give appreciations to the work around us. So hop on, become a true appreciator because we are going to be appreciating every single little piece of art out there. And I'll see you there.